thank you for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. I'm Audra Kane. This time on our show, Southeast Missouri State University head women's basketball coach Rika Patterson will join us to discuss not only the program, but more importantly, the relationships that can make a team better. Southeast Missouri has access to an organization that can help you, and we have Denise Wimp, the director of First Call for Help, here to explain the mission and work they do and how it can affect you and your loved ones. And finally, if you have guests coming in from out of town this summer or you're looking for something unique and educational to experience with your family, Cape Girardeau Convention and Visitors Bureau Director of Public Relations, Stacy Dohan Lane, has the plan you need. That's all ahead on Cape Chronicle. Whether it's for business or just a getaway, Cape Air is your wings in the Midwest. Cape Air serves six destinations, including Kirksville, Quincy, Fort Leonard Wood, Cape Girardeau, Marion, and Owensboro. Fly from Cape Girardeau to St. Louis with fares starting at just $49 each way. With easy connections through Lambert St. Louis International Airport, Cape Air connects you to the Midwest and the world. Book today at capeair.com or call 800-CAPE-AIR and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Cape Chronicle, I'm Audra Kane. Southeast Missouri State University has many teams of amazing student athletes, but for those who enjoy basketball, you know that team support can only make that team stronger. And the head basketball coach, Rika Bat Patterson, for the Southeast women's team strives to create an atmosphere of strong support both on and off the court. Thanks so much for coming today, Coach Thank Patterson. Thank you for having me. I I'm appreciate gonna, it. I'm going to relax a little bit and call you Rika. That's or, fine. Or Coach <laughs> Rika. We've known each other a little while, and, and I think that in the last couple of years, you are experiencing a couple of growth seasons with the team. Am, am I right in saying that? I would that? agree, yes. Okay, and so for the next coming season and hopefully you'll be here for more than just one um, because I'm a fan of both you and the team but hopefully in the next couple years uh, we'll see some growth what I want to know from you is or what our viewers might want to know from you is what areas of growth for the the team as individuals as well as a whole do you think you need to work on to to succeed in the future well, I have the wonderful pleasure of working with amazing young ladies. I mean, they come into the office and they just make every day better. Um, my goal, my purpose is to develop young women and instill confidence in them so that whenever they graduate from Southeast, they are prepared for life afterwards, whether it's working, whether it's um, being a mother, um, whatever their desires are, it's my job to help them prepare to get to that position. So as far as what this program needs, it's continued development. I think um, I'm really big on setting goals. I want the young ladies to come in with a set, set goals and let's see if we can work together to achieve them in the classroom, on the court, and then in their personal life. For us to continue to build a championship program, which is what we wanna do, then we have to look at who do we need to beat to be champions, right? Mm -hmm. And then how, what do we need to do to be our best? The only, I have three rules. Number one, do your best. And I don't mean just on the court, I mean as a sister, I mean in the classroom, I mean when we go to, in the community, just do your best. I will live with whatever happens. Number two is do what you're told. I say that because when they leave us, they gotta get a, a job and they gotta do what their boss tells them to do. And the third thing is to don't ever do anything that's going to embarrass yourself, your family, the program or university. So as we build a championship program, their individual development, uh, believing in themselves, working really, really hard when nobody's watching so that when the lights do come on and our fans do show up, they can produce and they can just give their best. So those are just areas that we're, you know, we're gonna continue to build on. I, that's like our whole interview wrapped up <laughs> into one fantastic answer. So let's get a little more specific. Um, you mentioned first the community mm -hmm. because Cape Girardeau is a fantastic community I agree. to bring student athletes into. Um, so for someone who's watching this program who perhaps has never attended a women's Red Hawks basketball game, what would you say is important or why would, would it be important for them to attend a women's athletic event? Well, the first thing I'm gonna say is 
I'm inviting you to come to the game. You have a personal <laughs> invitation from me to attend. Some people don't ever know about it. Some people feel like they're not connected to mm -hmm. it. Well, I'm inviting each of you to come next season. Uh, why come? Because we take pride in wearing this uniform and representing not only the university, but this community. I, one of the main reasons why I took this job was because of the people. Um, I used to coach in this conference before and I know how good the program can be and I know how supportive uh, this community can be. And whenever you're talking about building something, it, again, it's, about, it's, it's with people, staff, players, administration, and fans. There's nothing like bringing a recruit to a big game and being able to play in front of fans that are cheering for you. That's such an amazing thing to walk out into that Show Me Center, which is amazing, and have people standing up and cheering for our women's basketball players. I'm so appreciative of that. But why come? We're gonna play hard. We're gonna play tough. It's gonna be fun. You're gonna see a group of young ladies who compete with great effort and attitude and pride in Southeast Missouri. I almost want to say testify because <laughs> I've been at those games and I've seen, I've watched, I've watched Hannah. I can't think of Hannah's last name. Hannah No. Hannah No drop three point after three point after three point. And it's just amazing because you don't necessarily think, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to a, a smaller college. I'm going to go see these athletes. And they're great athletes. I mean, yes. they're talented athletes. And, I, I, you know, you see a lot of those sponsor advertisements now where they don't specify. They'll say it doesn't matter if they're a female athlete or a male athlete. They're athletes mm -hmm. and they're strong competitors. But I also know that and you mentioned not doing anything that would embarrass yourself or your family or the program or the university when they're out in public. Some of the things that these students do going out into the community and working with, say, organizations like Big Brothers, Big Sisters mm -hmm. is a huge part of what they're encouraged to do by the program, yes? Yes, community service is huge. It's something that our administration um, pushes um, all of our student athletes to do, not just women's basketball. And it's something that, as a head coach, you know, I feel we, we have a responsibility to this community to do right and to do good and to give back. There's nothing like um, young girls who look up to our players. And you talked about Hannah No. Well, Hannah likes to wear her shorts a, shirt, a certain way. And if you go watch like a little um, third and fourth grade team play and they're playing just like Hannah or they wanna be just like Adri, like that's a big deal. We were all little girls at one point mm -hmm. and we all had dreams. Whatever those dreams were, we all had them. And some of them dream to be basketball players. And I want our players to um, present themselves and represent themselves well because there's always someone watching. There's always someone looking at them that wants to be just like them. So I wanna make sure that our players understand that and that we make sure we give back to the community. We go to the schools, we do things on weekends with our community. So they're not just coming to our games to cheer for us. We are invested in the community and in the young people in this community. Uh, you you talked a little bit about having coached in this conference before. You came here from Baylor University. I was at Baylor. Yep, at one point. Mm -hmm. And as a as an assistant coach, was there something about this job, or was there someone back at Baylor who said this is the right time, this is the right opportunity for you? Well, I think there are a lot of similarities in Waco and Kate Gerardo. Um, we don't really in Waco. There's not a you're not competing with a professional organization mm -hmm. or a lot of entertainment. Mm -hmm. Well, we can be your entertainment, Absolutely. whether it's uh, football, men's basketball, women's basketball, soccer, volleyball, softball. We have so many sports here. So we can be uh, this community's entertainment and right up and down 55, just get off the highway and come see us. But it's that community that I was really looking, looking forward to. This has been my dream to be a head coach. I've, I've always wanted to do it but I didn't want to just be a head coach to be a head coach. I wanted to go somewhere where I felt like we had the resources to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, we had the administrative support to be successful. And then we had a community that was going to jump on board and um, help us build a championship program. You look at Baylor, you look at Connecticut. Those teams have fans in the stands. Well, I 
I think the invitation is in there. <laughs> so I hope to see them at the games next year because I'll be there for Good. sure. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Coach Patterson. I really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Okay. Well, Coach Patterson has been talking about Southeast basketball. Women's head coach, Rika Patterson. On the way next, finding help is only a phone call away with First Call for Help and Director Denise Wimp. Stay tuned for more of Cape Chronicle. We don't see problems, we see opportunities for creative solutions. At Southeast Missouri State, we don't think outside the box, we got rid of the box. We embrace innovation and turn ideas into successful businesses by learning from those who've been there before. We even offer a safe space to try out ideas before launching. Who else can say that? Entrepreneurship is everywhere. Let's make your ideas happen. The following is a public service announcement test to determine if you need a fishing license and boat registration before you head out on the water. Let us begin. Are you your own boat? Is this your idea of fishing with friends? Do you want this in your favorite lake? It. Regardless how you answered, you need to be licensed and registered. Do your part at takemefishing.org. There's more to history than books. At Southeast Missouri State, we're getting our hands dirty and preserving history. Our classrooms are museums, homes, and historic sites. Because the past can teach us so much more when it can be touched. We're preparing for the future. Because to know where you're going, you must know where you've been. Welcome back to Cape Chronicle. Finding help in a bad situation is not always easy and paying for it is oftentimes even harder. And the First Call for Help organization is here to assist you. Director Denise Wimp is here to explain. Denise, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you today. very much for having me. I appreciate it. So First Call for Help, tell us what exactly your organization is. Okay, so in generic terms, um, First Call for Help is an information and referral program. So what that means is I have a database of all the social service and not-for-profit organizations in a five-county area, and I keep the information on them as far as what services they provide, how they help, where are they, how do you contact them, um, and, and what services do they have for people. And then we operate a helpline for people to call in and just specifically say, I need help with whatever that is. And then we have a specific assessment um, that, of questions that we ask them to make sure we get them directed to the right places. So they explain their need, we ask a few questions, and then we get them connected to whatever agency may be out there that can help them the best. Okay, so you mentioned those agencies. Mm -hmm. what, what agencies specifically would, could that be? It's any social service agency in the five county area. So it could be food pantries, it could be a state office, um, it could be Habitat for Humanity, it could be the United Way, any social service not-for-profit type organization that provides a service to a person in need. So those are all in the database uh, for our counties. So are you partially, I mean, you, you mentioned the United Way, uh -huh. is that, uh, is there a part, a financial support partnership there yes. with the United Way? Yes, we are one of the funded partners um, of the United Way and actually the United Way spearheaded uh, bringing First Call for Help to our community roughly 20 plus years ago. Um, we've been in operation 18 years. There was a couple of years of development leading up to that. So the United Way did spearhead that of trying to find a way to unite the resources that we have around the people that need them. It's one of the missions, or it's part of the mission of the United Way to be able to do that. So when somebody is in a situation of need and they don't know who to call or who can help them, first call for help is the point of entry for that. So they can make one phone call and explain their situation and find out exactly where to go to get help. 
that alleviates that process of maybe going to the Yellow Pages, which is kind of old fashioned, um, or even sometimes Google. Um, if you're just looking and all you get is the name of the agency, their address and phone number, it doesn't tell you what their services are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you if you meet their criteria for services. Um, so sometimes that can just leave you to making hours and hours of phone calls and not finding the help that you need. This way you call one place, you make one phone call, you talk to one person, a trained social worker, to be able to find out what services are out there to help you. So you do have trained social workers on staff because that's important to yes. be able to discern exactly what it is the mm -hmm. person is asking Absolute, for. Absolutely, and to be able to treat people the way they need to be treated. A lot of times when somebody is making some of those phone calls, a lot of times they may get an unhappy receptionist or you know somebody who's having a bad day or they don't enjoy their job. For whatever reason, they may get somebody who's not the most helpful or the most friendly. And the social work degree, I'm a little partial to it because that is my degree, um, we're trained to be able to work with people appropriately and to treat people the way they need to be treated. Um, you know, there's no, there's no meanness, we're, we're nice. <laughs> I mean, we're just nice people. So I get more comments from people thanking us just for being nice sometimes. Sometimes having to ask for help is probably one of the most mm -hmm. difficult things mm -hmm. that people do. And so your organization and treating them with the level of respect, mm -hmm. not, not just level of respect that everyone deserves, but the level of respect sometimes that people need Absolutely. when they're in mm -hmm. that safe situation. So maybe you could give us an example of uh, of a case that mm -hmm. that highlights what it is you all can do for someone. Absolutely, so it sounds pretty simple. Somebody calls in, you give them some referrals, and thank you and goodbye. It's never that simple. When you're working with people, it's never that simple. Um, it's, it's round pegs and square holes. Nothing ever really fits exact, so you're always working to try to figure things out. So it could just be that somebody calls and says, I need assistance with food and we find out how many people are in the home and what town they're in and we give them the appropriate referrals to the food pantries and then they go take care of that on their own. It can be that simple. It's not normally. If you've ever worked with people, you know it's never <laughs> simple. Um, so an example would be we had a senior citizen call in needing assistance with his medicine. He's a, a widow, single guy living by himself. He was in his 70s and so based on just his initial call, he needed help with medicine. So we could have just given him referrals to um, a couple of places that help with medicine and then just kind of let it go with that. But because we do an assessment process with them, with the people that call, um, we found out that these medicines were added to an already long list of medicines that he's already taking that he already has trouble affording. And now there's even more added to that. So what we did was twofold. We worked with him to get the initial prescriptions filled because yes, you need to be taking these now. That's why the doctor gave them to you. And for future, how are you gonna afford these next month and the month after and the month after? So we have some agencies here in town that are set up specifically to work with seniors um, to help them with their paperwork. One is Apple. Um, it's a paperwork service for seniors um, and they work specifically to help those folks make sure they're enrolled in the right programs. So there are some discount programs for seniors for medicine. He wasn't enrolled in them. I know enough to know which ones they are and I knew enough to know he needs to be enrolled in them. So we got him referred to Apple. He'd never been there. He didn't know where they were. He wasn't comfortable calling them. He was uncomfortable calling me in the first place. So I did a lot of the legwork for him. I called on his, on his behalf, set up the appointment, called him back, here's your time, here's where you need to go. I gave him directions, just kind of walked him through the process and then followed up with him a few days later to make sure, he, did you get there and did you get enrolled in everything? And they actually saved him a, quite a bit of money on his medicine. So it's a whole lot more than just, here's a food pantry, thank you, goodbye. Th uh, that's medicine, medication mm -hmm. is probably one of the biggest needs in communities all across, all across. America. Absolutely. So it's, um, it's a great to know mm -hmm. that you all can help people and not just, like you said, give them a phone number mm -hmm. and then shoo them out the door. Exactly. Um, what what kind of funding or where is, just real quickly, sure. where where is some of the funding coming for your organization, First Call for Help? Sure. We are funded by, of course, the United Way of Southeast Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, we also get some other local community funds. Um, Southeast Health um, has been a partner with us from the very beginning. Um, we get some funds from the uh, county senior meal tax. 
Um, and we also get funding from the cities of Cape and Jackson, who also have been partners with us from the very beginning because they see a lot of folks calling city offices, the Chamber of Commerce, and this place and that place, where do I go for things? These are those people we were talking about who call and call and call, trying to find out what to do. And so it gives them, the cities, somewhere to refer people to where they know they're going to get help. Firstcallforhelp.org yes. is the... First call for help CMO. First call yes. for help CMO dot org, dot org mm -hmm. is the website to visit, mm -hmm. but they can also communicate with you absolutely um, via phone and, and contact the United Way is another way to get in touch with you. So, mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Thank you for I having me. I really appreciate, appreciate you being here because I know that there are people in the community who need that first call for absolutely. help. That's all good information. We've been talking with First Call for Help Director Denise Wimp. Next up on Cape Chronicle from the Cape Girardeau Convention and Visitors Bureau, Tacey, Stacy Dohan Lane has tips for your summer adventures. Stay tuned. At Southeast Missouri State, we know agriculture can mean so much more than working on the farm. It means research and lab work that lead to profitability and sustainability. It means creating new jobs, jobs that other people haven't even thought of yet. It means the spirit of entrepreneurship and the desire to make your own way. You want to do something groundbreaking beyond plowing fields. So let's get started. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. trends and styles may come and go. But the important things remain the same. Generation after generation, consistently there, creating moments and memories to last a lifetime. Like a true friend, the national parks have always been there for you. And now, you can be there for them. Support the National Park Foundation and help protect America's treasured places. This is Cape Chronicle and I'm Audra Kane. Travelers from outside, outside our area look to the Cape Girardeau Convention and Visitors Bureau for tips on hotels, restaurants, and activities while they're here. And Director of Public Relations, Stacy Dohan Lane, has even more for us today with the rich history of Cape Girardeau. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm, I, listen, I'm a huge fan of Cape Girardeau, as I know that you are. Working at the Convention and Visitors Bureau, you you just said I live and breathe what goes on in this town and we've talked in the past about different community events but um, as I said there's so much I mean this town is steeped in history absolutely and there are so many not only does the city work hard to preserve the mm -hmm. history but there are a lot of citizens that really work hard to preserve homes and they work with the city to preserve different areas of our community. And so having places for people to visit or uh, a website list, mm -hmm. you know, of historical locations that I know you've put together yeah. for visitcape.org, um, it, it makes it very easy for them you know, at their fingertips. To, and that's our goal. It's places. not really helpful for visitors if you just kind of say, well, here's all the historic attractions in and around Cape Girardeau. So we like to put together nice little packages so that it really takes the thinking and the planning out of it so that people can just, you know, print off that itinerary at visitcape.com forward slash back in time. They can print, go, and enjoy. Well, and what, uh, what you said is print off that itinerary mm -hmm. because you put together something that is basically a weekend in Cape Girardeau and yes. things you can mm -hmm. do. So let's kind of go down the list mm -hmm. because you sent it to me this week 
and it starts off with the Bullinger Mill. Yes, um, that is in Burfordville, Missouri. It's about a really pretty 30 minute drive northwest of Cape Girardeau. And it's this incredible four story pre-Civil War era mill. And you can walk down the stairs into this stone room and it, it get, the temperature drops because you're right there on the Whitewater River and you can see the mill that used to grind corn into mill and to kneel. And then you can also tour the rest of the mill. Um, and right next to Bollinger Mill is one of the only remaining covered bridges left in the entire state of Missouri. We have one of only four and you can walk across it. Um, it's one of my favorite picnic spots. The grounds are really beautifully maintained. So Bollinger Mill, it's a really neat way to step back in time and kind of see what everyday life was like in Cape Girardeau County um, in the Civil War era. I, it, it's a great place to visit. We've, yeah. we've been there before. Um, you, s you mentioned history because mm -hmm. there is the Cape uh, River Heritage Museum yes. that's on your list, mm -hmm. that's on the website. I've not visited this. Um, so tell me what they have because I know that they have some great displays They there. do and what's so cool about it is they kind of refresh their exhibits every year so you can go back every year and see something different. So the Cape River Heritage Museum is located in an old fire and police station and they've got some really cool exhibits on what life was like on the Mississippi River through the years, um, the building of the old bridge, the steamboat era. Um, right now they have a really incredible temporary exhibit in of some Ozark photography and they've got some great pieces on uh, Marie Watkins Oliver who designed the Missouri state flag. And right now they have a World War II exhibit, what World War II was like in Cape Girardeau. And some of the docents there did this research and found out that the first people to enlist after Pearl Harbor was bombed were two 17 year old African American young men. And they've got their pictures there and they look so brave and handsome in their uniforms. And then we hear so much about Ensign Girardeau, the fur trader, who kind of started the community of Cape Girardeau. I didn't know he was married and what her life was like. So they've done a lot of research into that as well. So I'm a Cape native, I've lived all my life. I promote Cape Girardeau for a living and I learn something every time I go. Um, and they're opening up for their season in mid-March and they're open through mid-December, Thursday, Fridays and Saturdays from noon to four. So they always have um, a really neat, eclectic, um, exceptional kind of mix of local history. So I, we only have a couple more minutes, but if you had to, there's a lot of other things know, on your so list much. for your weekend itinerary. <laughs> there's just too much to go through all of them. But if you had to choose, because there are so many locations right in the downtown area. Yes. If you had to choose one that was your favorite, what's I the okay, not I hate, miss? I hate to play favorites, but I love the Glen House. It's a fully restored Victorian mm -hmm. home. They've outfitted it all. Um, talk about a group of volunteers. Oh yeah. Um, they treat that home with such love and care. They do uh, Christmas tours mm -hmm. the, every December, and this year they have refurbished the servants' quarters. So for the first time, you can really see what life was like, not only for the Glenn family in the Glenn house, but for the folks who worked for the Glenn family as well. And they get kicked off for the season in May. So really excited for them to open their doors again for another summer. Fantastic mm -hmm. list of places to go. It's all on the website. Yes, visit cape.com forward slash back in time. Download the PDF itinerary. Um, you can just print and go and enjoy and have a wonderful time and make some memories of your own with your family. Well, thank you so much. Stacy Dohan Lane. She is with the Cape Girardeau Convention and Visitors Bureau. We've got to see some of these things for ourselves here in Cape Girardeau. And thank you for watching and we are Cape Chronicle. The program is a collaboration between the Department of Mass Media at Southeast Missouri State University and the city of Cape Girardeau. Our executive producer is Jim Dufek. I'm Audra Kane. Thanks for watching.